Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to stay on video for a short time here so I don't suck up all the bandwidth. And I want to say hello to everybody. My name is Tim uh, Timothy St. Germain. <clears throat> I'm the State Plant Health Director here in Washington. And if you were on some of the other webinars, I think earlier this month, Dr. Clinton Campbell, I think, did some, um, gave some information, provided some information on success stories for APHIS eradication of pests. And Ms. Yolanda Nguanzo, a pest survey specialist, talked about the CAPS program and surveys. And, and we all work together, so we try to provide as much information as possible on all those aspects. Protecting American agriculture and facilitating safe trade is, is what we uh, try to do, and that's our mission. So uh, what I'll be talking about today under this webinar is the APHIS section, uh, PPA, Plant Protection Act, Section 7721, funding that's provided to cooperators, tribal entities, universities, um, and and resources associated with that. So let me go off video here and just go ahead and get started. Okay, so here's the topics I'll be talking about uh, under the Plant Protection Act 7721 funding opportunities. Let's talk about the amount that is provided each year. Um, the APHIS's goals, that's essentially the projects that are uh, submitted uh, and under which goal associated with our mission and what the application process entails, what the evaluation process of the application entails. Talk a little bit about the spending plan, which shows which projects are provided to each cooperator based on their application. Go over a few examples that have been uh, that I think are most applicable to uh, to the audience. And then also a cooperative agreement. What is that? I, I I don't know if that's specifically unique to APHIS, Plant Protection and Quarantine, and our work with cooperators under the Plant Protection Act and um, the funding that goes out. But it is different from a grant and some of the people that are first-time recipients of funding. It's important for me to go over some of those differences just to make sure that everybody understands that there is a cooperative process. There is involvement with APHIS, whether it's review of work and financial plans, whether it is assistance during the project itself. And that's mainly how it differs from a grant and then the process of the cooperative agreement. But I'll, I'll go into all those in more detail as we go through these slides. So the, the first thing that I want to talk about is the amount that APHIS provides each year under the authority of the Plant Protection Act. <clears throat> and for our program, me as a state plant health director over Washington, Alaska, over plant protection and quarantine, our involvement is through the Plant Pest and Disease Management and Disaster Prevention Program. So super long acronym, PPDMDPP. Uh, so I'll... I probably won't say the acronym or the entirety of that, but um, it's important to know that that's what we're affiliated with and how we work with cooperators on uh, you know, providing funding. How much is available in that bottom little snippet there? There's approximately $63 million available for these projects and about seven and a half million available for the National Clean Plant Network. I highlighted a part of this that's important here for our audience. We will set aside up to four million in the Plant Protection Act for, to support tribes, tribal organizations, and universities, as well as minority affiliated organizations. So there is a big chunk of change out there for people that have projects that they want to do. Um, you know that that we can provide funding to them to do that. So touched on goals. So you may be wondering, okay, well, what type of projects can I do? How can I, you know, how can I get this funding? So Federal, state agencies, nonprofit organizations, tribes, universities, private entity, entities submit projects under these one of these six goals. Goal one through six here, one, enhanced plant pest and disease analysis survey. So that's essentially doing surveys or analysis on pathways for pests to come in the country. Target domestic inspection activities. Uh, goal three is strength and pest identification. Goal four, safe, uh, safeguard nursery production. Goal five, conduct target outreach and education. Goal six, increase mitigation and rapid response capabilities. So some examples of, of projects that have been uh funded. I, you know, goal five, I think, I think what we're doing right here, part of it is um, you know, 
what has been funded for for Joey Holbert and Washington State University and the Invasive Species Council. We have cooperative agreements with both of those entities, and it's been working out fantastically over the past few years, and, and we hope that continues. Uh, I think a lot of the people on the call may have heard about Northern Giant Hornet. Maybe it's been brought up on previous talks over the, uh, the past month that project to eradicate that pest that's that's been found in Whatcom County up in the very northwest corner of the state that's been funded under goal six increased mitigation wrap response capabilities for the past three years and and hopefully if everything goes as planned in this next year we can you know look at maybe a successful eradication and a very good use of the money so now that I've gone over the amount and what types of projects, how, how do you apply? Well, there is a open window time period from middle-ish of June through the middle or so of August. It's an eight-week time period where you as the cooperator, as the, as the tribal entity, can submit an application through our ServiceNow now process and, and if that's the only way some some of you uh that have applied before may be familiar with metastorm that is no longer the um, online platform of choice there's now a service now platform that is used it was used for the first time last year and actually went really well um i i hope that that i can provide this presentation out to everybody and i'll probably do that through joey but this link here, this suggestion submit, submission guidance document is a great document. It's one of the best that I've seen um, put together for cooperators. And it walks people through the exact process of getting an e-authentication password, getting access to ServiceNow, and just a step-by-step -step process of how to submit an application. So then after the application is submitted, what happens after that point? Well, there's an evaluation process. We put together teams for each goal. So there's six goals. We have six goal teams that consist of people from APHIS, from the National Plant Board, Tribal Nation representatives, Specialty Crop Farm Bill Alliance, other federal agencies, industry. We want a wide range of, of uh, backgrounds to provide feedback on all of the suggestions that have been submitted and this is the best way for us to get you know differing opinions and for us to find value in what has been submitted so after all that evaluation process happens then you know the, the best of the best essentially are selected and the way that that notification process happens is through the APHIS stakeholder registry which comes out usually in quarter one of the next calendar year of the submission. So taking this year, for example, if, if people want to submit a suggestion for evaluation, they do that between June and August of this year, calendar year 2024. You won't know until quarter one of 2025, essentially between January and March of 2025, whether that project has been received and not received, but approved and funding provided. The best way to be notified of that is through the APHIS stakeholder registry. I've got a link here, that first one uh, that ends in govdelivery.com. I strongly recommend everybody to sign up for that. And not only for the, for the seven, PPA 7721 notification when the spending plan comes out, but all other notifications that come out from APHIS, new pests that are found, new pests that are eradicated, um, any other possible funding information about PPA 7721 will come out through the stake stakeholder registry. And these two bullet points, uh, through it's from our 7721 program FAQs. It's a great document, especially for people that haven't gone through the PPA 7721 funding process before it has a lot of yes no this is what i can do this is what i can't do another you know, great document to reference so I, I talked about the spending plan a little bit so i want to highlight the fiscal year 24 spending plan this just came out february 6 2024 and this lists all of the projects that were approved from the people that submitted them back in in june through august of 2023 so that came out again, February 6th, 2024. 
And as you can see, there was uh, probably about 60. I, I didn't total up this, this amount, the funding level. But you can see goal 1S, enhanced plant pest disease survey, 15 million. Enhanced mitigation capabilities, goal six, that was about 28 million of the roughly 63 million. So it's by far the most uh, well used project and goals for people out there. We, you know, we're a early detection, rapid response. We fully support additional surveys in the state or around the nation. So if, if, um, so tribal entities would like to do surveys on tribal land. This is a great way to do that. If they want to look for pests that aren't here, like spotted lantern fly or spongy moth, which was formerly known as gypsy moth, um, you know, even northern giant hornet, uh, really any pest, Asian longhorn beetle, a lot of our program pests, that that those are the types of surveys that can be done on on tribal land with um, you know, with PPA 772 on funding. I want to point out down here this reserve funding that's important. I'll be going over that in a in a next couple of slides. 1.5 million for reserve funding. So getting a little bit more specific for the spending plan, this is what the spending plan looks like for Washington state. Of the 63 64 million or so, 2.9 million of that went to a variety of great projects in Washington state. Um, again, you saw goal 1S and goal 6 as the vast majority of what was approved. I think 13 out of the 19 here in Washington are either goal 1S or goal 6. Highlighted a couple here, the enriching tribal management, resilience and invasive species with co-designed educational resources. Dr. Joey Holbert, that was his suggestion that was submitted and approved. And also we had the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe Noxious Weed Control Project that was new for this year. And we're working with uh, the um, Muckleshoot Indian Tribe and it's, it's so far been working very well. So again, I wanted to bring up that snippet that I showed earlier. APHIS will set aside up to 4 million under the Plant Protection Act. And that is the reserve that I referenced and it's at 1.5 million. And so it's up to four. So there's still $2.5 million in funding that can be provided, you know, with the right projects that are submitted. So there's still essentially money that, that can be provided each year. Um, I think it's been between one and two million for the reserve funding over the past few years. So this last year, 2024, was right in line with what it's uh, what it's been historically over the past few years. And as you can see, again, you can see uh, uh, the Invasive Species Council and the Washington State University and uh, the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe were all on this list for the reserve funding since it was either from a tribal entity or uh, with the focus being outreach and work with, um, you know, the, the local tribes in Washington State. About three minutes left, Tim. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, sure. So I probably won't show the video then, but hopefully when I present this out to everybody, you can click on this. It's a, It was done by M3 Consulting, and it, this was done in 2020. A great YouTube video that was the result of this project where they talked about how noxious weeds can essentially persist for years, if not decades, in the environment and how they can affect native uh, flora and fauna and why we want to keep them out. So good interviews. Dan Fagerly was on there. I think that's a name that a lot of people know. He was interviewed. Jennifer Andreas for biological control out of Washington State University. She was on there along with uh, multiple tribal members. So highly recommend. Please do take a look at that. And I apologize for, for not being able to show it here. So quickly before I run out of time, I, cooperative agreements, what is it? Um, and essentially it is the mechanism that we provide the funding to the cooperator. And it starts with a working financial plan where it lists the objectives of the project, results expected, approach, plan of action, what will be accomplished, projection of accomplishments, criteria used to evaluate the project, number of personnel needed, supplies, equipment, so on and so forth. 
So this is something that we work with our cooperators and a lot of what is in the suggestion and the submission that goes in for evaluation in the first place, that information will then be transferred to the working financial plan, listed out in more detail so that we know what's happening. How can we help? How can we work with you? And then also a financial plan that needs to have specific calculations showing costs, who does what, benefits, travel, again, supplies, equipment, those types of things. How does it differ from a grant? The main difference is that there's substantial involvement from APHIS, from me, Dr. Clinton Campbell, from Yolanda and Guanzo, or other people in APHIS BBQ in the state where we help work on the work and financial plan, where we assist with surveys, where we're out, uh, you know, hopefully providing subject matter expertise. We have a science and technology department that can hopefully help with that as well. So that's the main difference, a grant where, where money is provided and not really much more involvement. Cooperative agreement, money is provided, but there is a need to have that involvement because that's the type of uh, agreement that's in place under the PPA 7721 funding. Just a quick overview of the process. It's long, it's convoluted, it's difficult, but it's manageable, it's doable. As long as we're working together on it, as you can see here, there's roughly 15 different steps don't want it to be overwhelming, but we're here to help. Dr. Holbert, uh, I know the Washington Basin Species Council has submitted and gotten approved on funding. So I think a lot of us on this call have gone through this or can provide information on it. And last thing, this is what it looks like at the very end and is a very welcome sight going through all the, you know, the suggestion submission all the way to full execution, which can be a year in the making. So it's doable. There's plenty of money out there. And please don't hesitate to contact us if, if there's any questions and, and, and how we can help. That's what we went over. Questions for me. Um, and hopefully, Joey can provide uh, the, the presentation out to everybody so they can click on links and access it and you know, talk with me or, or really anybody on the call if, they, if there's assistance needed.